Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Code Emporium, where we're gonna talk about validation techniques and their importance. So in typical regression, what we wanna do is when we have a cloud of data points, we wanna draw a curve through them. It kinda looks like this. Now, mathematically, this would involve creating a linear regression, perhaps, with parameters theta one and theta zero as the slope and the intercept of the line. And we would evaluate this or train this model using the mean squared error. And the mean squared error is the difference between the actual value and the predicted value, which is going to be essentially just the equation of this line. Now, why mean squared error is actually so good is because it can be decomposed into a bias term as well as a variance term. Now, I've explained a lot about bias and variance in another video, but essentially, good machine learning models have both a low bias for the estimate of thetas and also a low variance for the estimations of the thetas. And because mean squared error is proportional to both of these, a lower mean squared error would involve creating a better model. Mean squared error is used during training as well as evaluation time of your model. Now, with, a, with model evaluation, why are validation techniques themselves required? Well, the goal of validation and in general to evaluate your model, you want to find the true model performance on unseen data. And in the most ideal world, we could basically just keep getting data from the real world and just validate it probably with like mean squared error. However, unfortunately, we in the real world don't really have access to just unlimited amounts of data. And instead, we are working with a data set or just a fixed amount of data that we use for both training and evaluating our models. And so validation techniques become important working with this limited block of data. Now, one type of validation technique is the holdout validation technique where here's our block of data, which we split into a train set and a test set. The train set is used to train the model and the test set is used to evaluate it. And in this case, we compute the holdout validation by taking the mean squared error of all of these test examples. One of the fallacies of this method that you might hear is that it doesn't work that great if your data set is very small. This is true for some part because this instance of the data set is actually just one instance from the broader real world data. This could be, for example, just randomly a bad sample or randomly a really good sample that might not be representative of how data is in the real world. And what we want is the true model performance of unseen data. So holdout validation may not be up to the par in that case. However, Holdout validation is pretty reasonable with lots of data available. And this is because of the law of large numbers. This is a statistical principle that essentially states that as this test set goes on increasing, the average or rather the mean squared error of this sample is going to be representative of the true unseen mean squared error of the population. And based on our true goal, that's exactly what we want. And so holdout validation can actually work pretty well when you have a lot of data. Now, another technique that's typically used in validation is cross validation, where we essentially just break down our data into equal splits and we use one split for testing data, whereas the remaining splits we use for training data. And when we compute the mean squared error for our test data, we can store that in a variable error one. Then we repeat this process with a different chunk where we train on the remaining chunks, test on this chunk and get an error two. And we repeat this process depending on the number of chunks that we decide. In this case, it's five, so we have five errors. And in the end, the cross validation error is just going to be the mean of all of these errors. Now, a neat thing that this provides over the holdout validation set is that in the case that the data set is small, we now can use every single example for both training and evaluation. However, remember in the holdout validation set, we have only some amount of data that's for training, but this remaining data, which we could have used for training is now used for evaluation. 
And this training data, when it's very small, could have been very crucial to the model if we had more of it. And so cross-validation tends to be a very preferred technique with lower limited amounts of data. Aside from this, cross-validation also takes an average. So if there are some like crazy error examples that you get here just off the fly, all of those errors, when you average them up, will eventually come down to their truer value. And so they're not affected by these outliers as much because of an average. And so it's for this reason that cross-validation actually becomes very useful and versatile. Now, when you want to use holdout versus cross-validation is not a very specific rule. There are general guidelines though, like for example, based on what we've discussed is just the amount of data where if you have a less amount of data, you can probably use cross-validation. However, with more amounts of data, the holdout group and cross-validation both perform pretty well. But there are also other considerations to think about. For example, time dependence. This means that the data that you've collected is actually determined at very specific points of time. And if you have a time dependence in your data, you can't really use cross-validation in the form that we discussed because of the concerns of data leakage. To illustrate data leakage, let's look at an example. So let's say that this data block is arranged in ascending order of time. So this is the earliest data, this is the latest data. In this particular iteration of cross-validation, where we are testing on every single example in this set, each of these examples are later than any of the samples that were used to train the data. So this has no data leakage because this is exactly how we would use the model in production. However, in this case, we are now testing on data where the training set could have included data from the future. This is not representative of how we would actually use this model in the real world. We can't use training data that we haven't seen yet. And this is a good example of data leakage. And it's because of this that you might see the error become low during evaluation, but in the real world, the model will actually not perform that well and will actually see a higher error. And so with the time dependence, cross-validation in its current form is not usable. That said, there are also some time series renditions of cross-validation that you may be able to use. But for this case, I've now just indicated them with holdout to use holdout validation. Now, if there is no time dependence, however, you can use cross-validation. And if you have lots of data, you can use either cross-validation or holdout as a recommendation. Like I mentioned before, these are just recommendations, but they're not strict hard and fast rules. Now, another question that you might be thinking is, how many partitions do we really need to use in cross-validation? In fact, we can just have two partitions, one that's used for training and one that's used for evaluation, or we can split this entire data set into partitions such that every sample is its own partition. And this is the idea behind a specific case of cross-validation called leave one out cross-validation. Now, in order to determine the number of partitions, you might want to consider how well does this actually perform? And also, what is the amount of compute that is required? And one of the best ways to get an idea of performance is through simulation. Let's say that we simulated some data and we have now 40 data points for which we want to perform some form of cross validation. Now with 40 data points, we can have the number of partitions go as high as 40. This Y axis here is going to be the performance in terms of the complement of the mean squared error. From this graph, we kind of see that as long as we set the number of folds to be like around 10 or more, the performance of our model actually doesn't change with even increase in the number of folds in cross-validation. We also see something even similar with a larger number of data points with like 200. In this case, we can now increase the number of folds all the way up to 200, but there isn't really still any kind of performance difference, even if we had a very low number of partitions. So here the performance itself is dependent on the amount of data because for smaller amounts of data, you might have to increase the number of partitions, but beyond a certain amount, it really doesn't affect performance itself. 
Now for computation, if you increase the number of partitions, chances are it's going to take a lot more time to train. But whether this is actually a huge concern depends on the kind of model you're using and the amount of data that you have. Because if the model itself only takes like maybe 20 to 30 seconds to train, it's okay to increase the number of partitions without being too worried about computation, power, and resources. And so how many partitions in cross-validation really becomes less of an important question as you have more and more data. And that's all I have for today. I hope this gives you an intuition of what cross-validation is and how to use it very practically, as well as its advantages and disadvantages of different types of techniques. If you do like this video, please do give it a like. Comment down below if there's anything that you agreed or disagreed with, or if there's anything that you just learned today. I'm trying to grow a community here and I want it to be about learning. And thank you all so much for watching and for your support. And until next time.